So I think today probably marks the six and a half months I've been volunteering full time on the campaign. I'm actually from Virginia, Mount Jackson, close to West Virginia. Okay, don't judge me. Um, so I think what a cool kind of way to, way to introduce is to be able to be close to your hometown and after traveling up in New Hampshire, staying there for a couple months and then coming down here and getting to coordinate these events so that you guys can see her um, is an amazing opportunity um, to celebrate a one-of-a-kind individual who's so unique. Um, you know, who else do you know who's 21 and can say that they were on the state legislature, one of the youngest people actually to ever do that? Who do you know who can say that they're a major in the National Guard and running for president, the first female combat veteran ever, ever? How is that for woman empowerment, right? That's amazing. It deserves a clap, right? The first, so you have a Hindu woman of Congress representing so many different types of minorities so well. And getting to see her here, close to your hometown, getting to, you know, just present an opportunity where she can come and speak and show you guys how amazing and she truly is. And what a, what a special and unique candidate to be able to represent and volunteer for. So I'm very, very, very happy to introduce the next president of the United States. Tulsi Gabbard. <laughs> I want a round of applause for Jade, everybody. <laughs> she was outside. She's been volunteering for months on our campaign, traveling with us to different states, and really, really huge help in our campaign. And outside, she's like, Thais, are you going to introduce me? She's like, no, but there's no one else. <laughs> Good job, Jade. Uh, I want to say thanks to Fred, Fred uh, Snowden. Thanks for hosting us here in your beautiful okay. space. Great to be here. And thanks to all of you for taking time out. This, this was uh, kind of an awkward time to have a town hall this morning, uh, but it's the only time that we had and want to maximize the time that I'm in the DC area. I'm glad we could drive down. So thank you for making the time. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know we don't have that much time, so I'd like to just kick us off um, on what I think is, is the, central, the central issue that we're facing in the country right now. There are a lot of different things that maybe you're coming here most concerned about, different specific issues that, uh, that you're considering as you're thinking about who you want to vote for in this election. But to me, at the heart of all of this, at the heart of our ability to be able to solve any one of the problems that we're facing, lies in the necessity for us as a country to bridge these terrible divides that are tearing us apart to break through the hyper-partisanship and the gridlock in Washington so that we, the people, can once again have the confidence that those who are working in the people's house are doing the people's business rather than serving the interests of the powerful elite. There is so much that we can find that is disheartening, that is that is heartbreaking, that is frustrating and angering when we see the news every day on cable news or on Twitter. We see just how divisive everything is, how much is driven by anger or hatred or bigotry, how much is fueling this, this new cancel culture that we live in, where if you say something that is maybe a little bit offensive or a little bit different than what someone else says or believes or stands for, then you're canceled. We don't want to talk to you. We don't want to know about you. To me, these things are undermining the very principles, the very foundation of who we are as a country, the very foundation uh, in, of the bedrock of, of our Constitution. There was a quote recently that I read on uh, President's Day. Different people sharing different quotes that they found inspiring from presidents that they loved or felt inspired by. But it was one I had never heard, but that very directly 
speaks to where we are as a country and what we need to do as individuals and what we need our leaders to do. Abraham Lincoln said very simply, I don't like that man. I need to know him better. That's it. You use that, I've never heard it before. I read that and I thought, my gosh, this is it. I don't know that man. Exactly. Well, you look at the day-to-day -day of what's going on. The day-to-day -day where people are so busy, busily focused on the I don't like part of it and refuse to see as Abraham Lincoln did, well, I actually need to get to know you better. I need to get to better understand your perspective or where you're coming from, the experiences that you're bringing that cause you to hold this position or to say these things. I need to know him better. And that is exactly where we start. Get away from the polarization, the hyperpartisanship, break through all of those barriers, and let's just get back to the basics of who we are as Americans, treat each other with respect, no matter our politics, no matter where we come from, no matter how we worship or if we worship or what our profession is or any of these other superficial things, go to our core of what it is that unites us. And this is the secret of how we, how we as Americans together begin to forge this path forward towards that more perfect union that our founders envisioned for our country. So how does this change happen? It happens obviously with leadership, setting that culture of leadership from the very top to hold that torch, to say, hey, this is who we are and this is where we are going to help to begin to heal these divides, but this change also has to take place with every one of us, with our friends, with our families, with our coworkers, the people in our own little spheres of influence, no matter where they are in our lives, to start to think about how can I be the change? How can we, the people, bridge these divides and hold our leaders accountable? so that they are not thinking every day in Washington, well, how can I serve my party's interests and either keep power or take power back or another? Because the oath that we take, every one of us as members of Congress, after every election, we gather on the House floor, raising our right hands, taking that same oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic and bear true faith and allegiance to the same. It's not an oath of loyalty to one party or another. It's an oath of loyalty to our Constitution, this country, and the American people. And that is what is required to solve problems, to do the work of the people, to instead of looking at, well, who has the most powerful lobbyists and how much money are they giving from their PAC? How is that impacting the policies that are being made? No. It's getting back to, to, to having the faith and confidence that your leaders are working for you. And to drive this home to a present day crisis that we are facing now with the coronavirus, right? This is an issue that is of great concern to all of us. I was watching the headlines last night as officials are saying, well, it's, it's inevitable. It's inevitable. The coronavirus is going to come here, and it could take the lives of one to five million Americans. And in the midst of this pretty depressing outlook of already conceding defeat, we have partisan bickering. Well, how much money do we need to put towards trying to prevent this what looks to be a pandemic from reaching our shores. Well, Democrats are saying this and Republicans are saying that and fighting with each other over what that path forward should be rather than standing together as Americans, just as we would in wartime where we're experiencing a direct threat to our health and well-being and safety, except this time the enemy is a virus that is threatening our safety and well-being. Instead of standing together, necessary, taking whatever action we need to to protect the American people. Instead, we're seeing more of the same, putting political, partisan political interests ahead of the interests and the well-being of the American people. 
So there's a very direct impact, both in the day-to-day -day working uh, goings on in Congress, but also especially during this critical time of actually looking at how do we solve problems? How do we make sure that you know, we're, we're suspending flights coming from other countries who have yet to contain the outbreak of this virus? How do we protect our people in our shores from this taking hold? How do we make sure that our healthcare professionals and first responders and teachers and employers, how do we make sure that everybody knows what they need to be doing to prevent this from spreading? It's something we've got to take seriously and it's something that's not just impacting one party or another. It's something that requires, I think, uh, I see a few familiar faces here. You, you hear me talk a lot about how foreign policy is domestic policy. This is a perfect example of that. Our global community is so small. And it's during times like this that we realize somebody's just one plane ride away from any other country, any other region in the world. And so for us to be isolated and say, well, we're just going to figure this out ourselves, but not work with other countries like China, Japan, Korea, Iran, Italy, many of these other countries, then we are undermining not only our safety and well-being, but the safety and well-being of this global community that we live in. So this is something that's obviously present day, but there are many different examples that, uh, that we can look to. I'll close on this point. Foreign policy is domestic policy. There's a great cost to the foreign policy decisions that we are making in this country. So as some may be balking about, well, how many billions of dollars do we really need to prevent this coronavirus outbreak from taking hold here in the United States? Some have said it should be two billion, four billion. The Senate's putting forward eight billion. People concerned about what the cost will be. Just to put this into context, we're spending four billion a month in Afghanistan right now. Right now. So if people are bickering about do we spend two or three billion to help prevent what could potentially be the loss of millions of American lives right here at home, let's just look at how our taxpayer dollars are being used and where they should be. This is why I talk about this issue so often because Unlike what many in, the, in uh, uh, the corporate media or on the debate stage would have you believe, foreign policy is not just one little side issue that has no impact on us here at home. I get asked this all the time. Why do you talk about foreign policy so much? Why don't you talk about things that are happening here at home? Well, if people are telling you we don't have enough money to buy the testing kits for this coronavirus, our healthcare professionals don't have enough masks to safely take care of people, we don't have the basics that we need here at home, and yet we're seeing billions and trillions of our taxpayer dollars going off to pay for wasteful regime change wars, overthrowing dictators in other countries, nation building those countries, fueling a new Cold War and nuclear arms race, all of which are not making us any safer. And yet, over and over, we're told, you know what, there's just not enough money. Not enough money for the things that our families, our loved ones, our children, our people need right here at home. And that is why I'm running for president, because as commander in chief, very directly, I can lead our country and bring about this sea change in our foreign policy that puts an end to these wasteful wars and really focuses on our priorities, the safety, security, and freedom of the American people. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for your time. I'd love to open it up to the discussion here. Uh, Jade has a microphone. Uh, mic, stand. Got a mic stand right here if everyone who has a Might question a wants bit. to line back. Okay, there we go. I was a uh, congressional staffer 40 years ago when there was some semblance of uh, bipartisanship. Who, where, did, who, where did you work? What did you do? I was a congressional staffer on the House side. <laughs> okay. And uh, for, for a Democrat and a Republican. Mm -hmm. um, when there was a semblance of bipartisanship and rationality. And I'm wondering now, based on your experience in Congress, do we still have one nation or are we simply a, a, a bunch of competing nations? 
I also worked as a congressional staffer um, between my two deployments to the Middle East for one of our U.S. Senators from Hawaii, who at that time was the chair of the Veterans Affairs Committee. And even then, he was coming towards the end of his time in service there. But even then, there was still that um, civility and that respect where people could have fierce debates on the Senate floor, but still uh, find a way to be able to get it done in the end, to make some compromises without losing focus on what the ultimate objective of service is. And towards the end of his life, I remember talking to him in Hawaii after I'd been elected to Congress, and he just expressed his deep dismay about how that, um, that focus on that mission of service has, has really been lost. Uh, we are one nation, but we are deeply, deeply divided. And, you know, when we say the words, you know, the house opens with the Pledge of Allegiance every single morning. We are one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. We are so far from where, what those words, the picture that those words paint of who we are. And they serve as a daily reminder, but I don't think enough people are listening and applying those words. Uh, like I started out with, this is, this is both the challenge and the great opportunity that lies before every single one of us to heed that warning about how a house divided against itself cannot stand. And it is our future that's at stake. Is it the future of our country? is what's at stake, and we cannot afford to allow this divisiveness to continue to rip us apart. Angela Vula, I'm on the steering committee of Our Revolution, Northern Virginia. Congresswoman, I wanted to first thank you for your courage in speaking out. I wanted to let you know that there is now a new draft bill in the U.S. Congress uh, calling for a $4 trillion national infrastructure bank with no new debt. This bank would create 25 million new jobs, union, high paying wages to build all the critical infrastructure we need. Rail, power, energy, hospitals to deal with the coronavirus, affordable housing, broadband, et cetera. This has been uh, endorsed by all the municipal elected officials in the country, the National Congress for Black Women, it has been endorsed by three major Democratic uh, parties in Northern Virginia, Fairfax, Alexandria, and Loudoun County. And this would be our opportunity to unify the country around a positive mission. In fact, it was not only uh, created by Alexander Hamilton, but used by Abraham Lincoln uh, at the point that the country was disintegrating and also Franklin Roosevelt to get us out of the Great Depression. And I would like to know, and also it would, uh, uh, solve the income and wealth gap and get the economy back to the 99% and out of the hands of the 1%. And I would like to know uh, if you would support this idea. Thank you. It sounds like an incredible opportunity and one that can bridge the, bi the, the hyper partisan uh, divide. I need to go through the bill myself and take a look at all the details. But going all the way back to, I remember right after the 2016 elections, when a lot of Democrats were just feeling like there was no hope and opportunity to do anything, given the outcome of the election, I was asked by a lot of reporters, well, what, what, what is the thing that could find, you could find common ground across party lines? And infrastructure has always been, to me, the lowest hanging fruit that creates that opportunity because I've had a chance to visit a lot of communities all across the country throughout this campaign. Just like my hometown in Hawaii, heavy infrastructure investment necessary. Every community may be having slightly different needs, but every member of Congress needs those dollars, those jobs, that investment to take place in their communities. Really just comes together to figure out what's the process and the mechanics for getting it done. I think it's totally possible and necessary. So I look forward to being able to look at the bill. And thanks for your work and advocacy on this and getting support for it here in Virginia. Thank you so much. We'll get you the bill. Thank you. Hello, Tulsi. Hi. And we have a lot in common. As you can probably tell by my accent, I'm from the deep south. Of Australia? The real south, yeah. <laughs> well, you'd know. So yeah, we had surfing. But yes. 
a lot of what you say really resonates with me. I'm about to become a, a resident of your country. I can't vote. Uh, if I could, I'd be voting Thank for you. you. The reason I'm here is that we need the US to take a lead role in the global campaign for a kinder world. The city of Salisbury in Maryland is the first city to receive international endorsement as a world kindness city, which was declared in Switzerland at the 10th General Assembly last November. I'm asking you for your support to put kindness on the national agenda and see the US co-sponsor a, no a motion at the United Nations to declare support for a kinder world, thereby ensuring that we have a license to practice kindness under any regime. Can I get a response to that? Who's leading this in the UN? You say co so this hasn't no, been has it gone to you know, We're stunned. We can't do this because what strikes a chord with me is your declaration of support, uh, your declaration of independence, a young nation, all men are created equal. A lot of people signed that, didn't necessarily understand it or believe it. But eventually it found its way into the hearts and minds of a nation, yeah. for the most part, it's a work in progress. But it had a ripple effect. Yeah. And that ripple effect found its way to a farm in South Africa to a young boy called Nelson and to the streets of India to a law student called Gandhi, closer to home in Atlanta, son of a preacher. And it influenced nations. Still, our hope is that this declaration will find its way maybe to a classroom maybe in Pakistan, to a young girl called Malala, where they find the courage to be kind, the courage to speak up, despite the adversity, undaunted. And your message is very clear, because when you identify the word indivisible, that's what's got to happen. Yeah. We've got to bridge the great American divide. And I believe finding our courage to be kind in the home of the brave is key to this. And out of all the candidates yes. that I've been looking at, you're the one that will be yeah. the best advocate for this. Yeah. Well, this, this is not something that I can tell you I will do because I'm already doing it. Uh, this is why across the country, throughout every one of our town hall events, we have Democrats, Republicans, Independents, and Libertarians coming together and saying, we see each other, we treat each other with respect, and we're here to put the well-being and the interests of our people in our country first. What you are describing is what we in Hawaii call aloha. There you go. It's leading with aloha, which is a, a word that doesn't mean hello or goodbye. It actually means I come to you with an open heart. I come to you with respect and with care and compassion and see each other for who we are, that we are all connected. We are all brothers and sisters, no matter all of the other distinctions and your, your unique qualities that we have. So I will continue to lead with aloha in everything that I do. Thank you. Thank you. Morning, Tulsi. Good morning. Uh, Yaki from Maryland. Thanks for being uh, here. Thank you kindly. Just wanted to ask you a question about the CIA. I see it as another facet of the regime change war aspect, something that you're actively campaigning against. I just want to know what your uh, policy would be in terms of their role. Would you expand, contract? What would you plan to do with them? Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, you're right to point out that as I talk about regime change, regime change wars, it's, it's taken many different shapes and have, has had many different uh, paths towards um, fulfilling that longstanding foreign policy the United States has had across both Republican and Democrat administrations uh, going all the way back. We can't actually, this is, this, is, this is a problem as in the news today when we're talking about Iran policy, for example that it's talked about in a, in a bubble as though the things that we're dealing with now and the challenges we have now just appeared out of thin air. To understand what's happening now and why it's happening and where we need to go, we have to go back and understand where it began with the CIA-led overthrow of Mossadegh in Iran. At that time, 
because he wanted to maintain the Iranian people's control over their oil resources rather than having it be controlled by the UK and US uh, oil corporations. We see a lot of examples of uh, these things where the United States has come in and overthrown a dictator or leader of a country, whether it's through the CIA or military means, or even through the use of what is essentially a modern day siege, which are sanctions, which ultimately end up harming and hurting the people in these countries the most. Um, look, I think there's a role for the CIA in intelligence collection, in making sure that we have the information that we need to be able to make um, uh, the best decisions possible for our country and our national security interests. But when I'm talking about the end of regime change wars, uh, I am being inclusive and comprehensive in every avenue that we've used uh, to accomplish that and really use that change in our foreign policy so that we're leading um, with a focus on cooperation rather than conflict, that we're not running around trying to be the world's police, but instead actually trying to see how can we be a force for good uh, in the world, treating other nations with respect, being able to leave those doors open even as we can negotiate to work out our differences that we may have with other countries, that we're able to work with them on the many areas we have shared in common interest, like preventing a pandemic, like counterterrorism, like climate change. There's so many things that we've got to be able to work with leaders in the global community on, which we cannot do if we're saying, you are my enemy, you are my enemy, and there's no space there to say, well, we can take this with a win-win approach, rather than the zero-sum mentality that we've seen in our foreign policy for so long. Hi, Tulsi. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anand. Thank you for coming to Sterling, first Thank of you. all. Uh, my question is <clears throat> more related to, uh, more generally related to American lawmakers um, judging the decisions of other democracies, <clears throat> and more specifically related to, especially in the left wing of your party, we see uh, American lawmakers, both senators and congressmen, commenting on a decision made by the Indian democracy that allows minorities from neighboring Islamic countries to get, get automatic citizenship in India. Um, what, are you, what is your position on, uh, on that and generally whether American lawmakers should comment on established democracies? I'm not talking about dictatorships around the world. I'm talking about India as a known democracy. It's established democracies. I think if you look at uh, democracies around the world, uh, th there are decisions that are being made by parliaments or Congress, whatever they're called there, that uh, we, we can agree or disagree with what those decisions or policies are. Uh, ultimately, as we have seen and continue to see in our own country, that it requires us uh, the people who are participating in that democracy to exercise their voices and to make sure that the, the changes we want to see are made here at home. Uh, similarly with other countries, we have to respect those people, the people of India who are going through some political turmoil and who are going through major changes to be able to make that evolution and get to the place where they want, uh, where they want the future of their country to exist. Thank you. Hello. Hi. So I feel climate change is a big issue, but I feel that factory farming is the big cause as it leads to deforestation as well as other issues uh, like the cruel treatment of animals. How would you tackle the factory farming? And I, and I ask you this because I feel like you're the only one who truly cares about the environment being vegan. Yeah, thank you. You're, you're exactly right. This, this climate change issue is one that even as it's getting more and more attention here and around the world, uh, there's very little focus on the impact of whether it's factory farming or other forms of uh, agriculture that have such a, uh, play such a contributing role in the environmental threats that we face, whether it's the carbon that's being output into the atmosphere or the pollution of clean water and waterways, the pollution of air. Uh, I've traveled through some states that have a lot of factory farms in them and 
what we're seeing is that the people who live in these communities, they may not be coming from the place that you are as you're raising this issue, but they are taking action at the local level to put a moratorium on those factory farms. And they're working to try to get them shut down because their children and their families are being impacted. You cannot drive through these communities without experiencing the stench and the environmental impact. They have signs up at all these different, the waterways and streams saying, don't let your dog drink water from this stream because it could kill them. And so there, there are very real detrimental impacts to agriculture as we're looking at the overall environmental challenges that we're facing and agriculture has to be one of the major focuses there. So the same kinds of changes that we're making at the local level, the same kinds of changes I think we need to be making nationally. Factory farms should not be a part of our agriculture system. We need to empower and incentivize more people to look towards regenerative farming, to look towards you know, organic and sustainable farming, local and regional farming, that actually helps to support the needs of our local communities with less of an environmental impact, and even seeing how things like regenerative farming will have a positive impact on recapturing carbon and protecting our environment. Uh, Thank you. I feel a lot of people, they uh, became really big fans of you after the Joe Rogan podcast, so oh. I think a lot of people are here because of that. Thank you, I appreciate it. <laughs> Good morning, Congresswoman. Good morning. My name is William Patton. I'm from Maryland. I'm actually on the ballot as a delegate for you. Thank you so much. You're welcome, and thank you for running for president. Thanks. Uh, the last uh, questioner just mentioned the Joe Rogan podcast. Yeah. On one of those interviews, he asked you if you had ever heard the John F. Kennedy American University speech from June 1963. Yes. This is the great speech about, for those who don't know, where he basically announced the nuclear test ban treaty. Yeah. He planned on ending the Cold War. He criticized government secrecy, armies by day, guerrillas by night. Mm -hmm. And my question is, have you since yes. Uh, yes, I have. studied that speech? Many okay. times. And I assume it served as an inspiration for you? Very much so. And I view your campaign as one uh, a modern version of that in that you're in the category of Mike Gravel and Dennis Kucinich, your friend, Ron Paul, other truth tellers, and that's why your candidacy is getting marginalized by the mainstream media. And what, what are, are some of your plans to bypass that beyond just your uh, grassroots supporters, many of whom are here? Yeah. Thanks for your question. And the answer to the first part is I have listened to and read that speech many, many times, and it is incredibly inspiring to see the kind of courage that he exercised then as president to raise issues that were highly controversial at that time, that he was heavily criticized for, but he had the foresight to see how dangerous uh, it would be if we in the United States, he as the president of our country, did not um, provide that leadership to work with other countries to focus on ending that Cold War, to focus on non nuclear non-proliferation, to focus on uh, how we can provide the peace of mind, both to the people in our country and people around the world, that fear of nuclear attack and catastrophe should not be one of the concerns uh, that they have. This is an issue I've made central in my campaign. I'm the only candidate, actually, that's talking about it even as nuclear strategists uh, over and over are sounding the alarm bell saying, we're 100 seconds before midnight on the doomsday clock. This new Cold War and increasing tensions between the US and other nuclear armed countries is pushing us closer to that brink of nuclear catastrophe, whether by accident or intentional. And we've got to do something about it because it doesn't have to be this way. Um, the corporate media has almost completely blacked out our campaign, or uh, if they do cover it, it's usually to try to smear or undermine the message that I'm bringing. The way that we're bypassing that is just maximizing every other platform available and recognizing that more and more people across our country are dissatisfied with the constant noise of talking heads on TV and are turning to things like the Joe Rogan podcast and other alternative formats to be able to get better informed on different issues. 
Uh, I just started a podcast. If you're not subscribed, check it out. There are a lot of other platforms that we're looking to, uh, to be able to help continue to uh, speak directly to people in this country, shine a light on different issues that you won't see on the news, uh, but issues that affect and impact all of us as Americans. And I ask for your help, every one of you, to help increase that impact. Share these things with your friends, your coworkers, people in your network, so that uh, we, the people, don't have to be solely dependent on those voices that the corporate media chooses to allow us to hear. Uh, thank you for that. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Cynthia Urville, also from Maryland, from the Fluoride Action Network. And uh, we're trying to prevent fluoride poisoning through stopping water fluoridation. Uh, is this happening at the local level in your community, or is it a statewide initiative? It's, it's a national organization, and one thing we do is figure out whether the state has been convinced by the CDC to mandate it. So my state, Maryland, is not mandated, but Ohio, Minnesota, many states have mandates. So you have to figure out who the decision maker is and then try to convince them. And uh, I've been able to do, unable to do that despite a long career in preventing lead poisoning because the CDC recommends it. So in the last two years, um, uh, studies have come out that have been funded by the US. They used to be coming internationally and then we didn't pay attention to them. But now we have studies showing that fluoride in pregnancy too much can lower uh, a child's IQ. And more importantly, when formula-fed babies, uh, formula is made with fluoridated tap water, lowers the IQ by eight points. Uh, that is so drastic uh, and affects a child's chances in life to earn a good living and to contribute at a high level um, that I hope, I hope this becomes better known. But for now, it's because the CDC is funded at least $15 million a year to promote it. So as an abolitionist, um, uh, we want to get rid of it, but just like slavery, we are also against the extension of it. And despite the studies in the last three years that showed profound harm to the developing brain, the CDC is still going to states and trying to get them to mandate it. So I'm here to salute somebody or other named uh, Mike Gabbard, <laughs> who apparently yesterday introduced a bill in Hawaii to ban fluoride. So um, we're grateful for that. I know that. him a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. This, is, this has been an issue in our state yeah. um, where, uh, you know, I, I think that this it should not be a federal mandate, and this should be a determination that's made. And there have been a lot of folks year after year that this, is, this question has come up um, who have successfully lobbied against the fluoridation of our water that is amazing. It's one of the best water qualities of, of any state uh, in the country, and we want to keep it that way. And it correlates to good health in Hawaii yeah. because it affects so many parts of the yeah. body. Sorry, we don't have yeah, that sorry. much time, so there's a few people behind you I want to... I want to make sure we can get to as many questions as we can. Thank you for being here. We're, we're going to try to get through. Uh, we can be quick here. Yep. Make sure to keep your questions brief and short <laughs> and concise so that we can get through as many as possible. Thank you. Jade is 17 years old, y'all. She's laying it down here. <laughs> uh, hi, hi, Congresswoman. I am uh, Amy Kuo. I'm actually, I actually attend the community college right across the street. So awesome. I'm a local. What community college is that? Uh, the Northern Virginia Community College, okay. also known as NOVA. Yes. Uh, but my question kind of piggybacks off of the guy who was before the woman in front of me, and it has to do with like social media yeah. and stuff. I'm not sure if you've ever been asked this before, but what is your stance on things uh, on the so-called like hate speech and censorship thereof because as an American like growing up here uh, in this area I was taught that the First Amendment uh, protects our free speech 
so what uh, it's <laughs> Sorry, I'm nervous. No, I, I know. I think I know where you're going with this. Yeah, like I, I just want to know what your opinion is because, as someone who goes on the internet a lot, and I, I'm sure that all of us do, and as someone who doesn't always say what the majority agrees with, I always have this somewhat constant fear of like, oh, I'm going to get banned, like for just saying the wrong thing, yeah. or like, it's, what yep. are your thoughts? Yep. Uh, I, I agree with you. I mean, the, the First Amendment is, is kind of that, that pinnacle uh, point upon which everything else, you have freedom of the press, freedom of religion, all of these different freedoms enshrined in our Constitution, and the freedom of speech is one that really allows us to, whether it's in a physical space like this, or you know, it's, it's at work or wherever it may be, but it also should apply to uh, our online public squares where we're having these conversations. And I know this is something that's going through the courts right now. Uh, I haven't seen the full, art I haven't read the full article yet, but apparently there was a ruling by a court somewhere saying that because uh, companies like Google and Facebook, YouTube, Instagram, because they're private, companies that they are not required to uh, uphold First Amendment rights. I need to look further into that. I've, I've heard that there's some difference between whether it's a publisher or a platform. If there is. Yeah. There is a difference there, which is covered under Article 230 of our laws now, where uh, social media companies are not held to the same liability standards as a publisher. Uh, but I'm working on legislation right now to address this because you have Facebook, you have Google and YouTube, you have them clearly making content decisions about whose voices they want to allow to be heard or seen and making decisions about those that they will either delete your account or they'll push you so far down that no one will ever see the message that you're delivering. Therefore, they are making publishing decisions and they're not providing a neutral platform as they're presenting themselves to be for that uh, online kind of public square opportunity for people to, to air their views, whether I agree with them or not. This is kind of the whole point here, is that um, if you're presenting yourself as a social media platform where people can come and present their own ideas and have those debates in that online public square, then that's one thing. But if you're being a publisher and you're deciding, well, I agree with you, I agree with you, I disagree with you, disagree with you, then you need to be held to the same liability standards as uh, a traditional publishing corporation or entity would. And that's what my legislation seeks to, uh, to fix. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, Congresswoman. Hi. Hi. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I just wanted to ask you a question. Um, I was reading an article today from Vanity Fair, a profile of you. Um, from 2013, and they talked about you like you were a mix of Beyonce, Hillary Clinton, and Captain America. They were very, uh, the mainstream media was very fond of you. They were pushing you as the next big Democrat. Mm -hmm. And when you made the decision to not endorse Hillary Clinton, you gave all that up. I'm asking you as a personal question, why? Why did you make that choice? Because I have never been interested in politics as a quote unquote career. I have only been interested in how I can best be of service. And I made that decision not to endorse Hillary, to resign as vice chair of the DNC, to endorse Bernie Sanders at that time because I saw the huge difference between both of them as it relates to foreign policy and what kind of commander in chief they would be. And I saw how the media at that time was paying no attention and shining no light on the huge gap between Hillary Clinton's war hawk interventionist approach to foreign policy and Bernie Sanders' largely non-interventionist view on war and on peace. And I knew that as an American, as a soldier, as a veteran, I needed to do my part in bringing this voice on this issue to the forefront. I have and will always do my very best to do what is right, whether it's politically popular or not, because it's not about me 
or how many glowing profiles some magazine writes about me or what parties I get invited to in Washington, D.C. I am not interested in the popularity contest there. My sole motivation is to be of service to our country and to every single one of you, and that is what drives every decision that I make. Thank you. You are more than a congresswoman. You are more than a combat veteran. You are uh, more than a presidential candidate. You are Tulsi. Yes. And, and I think uh, you are selfless. Uh, and I think uh, the word Tulsi uh, might become a verb to do the right thing uh, with everything. Uh, I just wanted to uh, point the divisiveness you talked about uh, is uh, because we have two political parties and uh, to stay in power, you know, it, it, they divide people. It seems like one-on-one -on -one of political strategy. Uh, and, you know, when we say why don't they get along, uh, there is a clear reason because people don't want them to get along. So rather than blame the politicians, I think our political process and the media and, and the whole thing is such that uh, they simply cannot get along. So to do that, I think the political process would have to change. I think you're the right person. Uh, I think this is a movement you started. Uh, you know, the foreign policy, the domestic policy, you know, the kind of information people consume from where, how they make up their minds, some snippets, you know, the, the media created this ick factor about you. Uh, but I see on the alternate channels the you know, groundswell of support for you tremendously. And, you know, I guess one solution would be, uh, you know, term limits. The, the other thing would be, you know, number of things. And if you could speak about those into your movement and, you know, get the youth fired up, I think, you know, I think this would be a great movement. Uh, uh, you will do great things. We are here to support you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Congresswoman, I'm going to ask you about something which I already know in advance that you support, but it has to do with the fact that one failure, in my view, of this presidential election on the Democratic side has been accepting the narrative that the U.S. and world economy is now, particularly U.S. economy, is in such great shape. In fact, what we've seen is a complete failure since the crisis of 2008 and 2009. Now we're facing another bubble blowing out, perhaps uh, the, it will be pricked by the coronavirus, but it's really a bubble in the financial system, including $200 billion being poured in per day. So in the same way that you have courageously brought up the danger of nuclear war, which other people don't want to think about, don't you think it's about time we tell the truth that we're facing another collapse? One of the other steps, besides what my colleague Angela mentioned before, on a national infrastructure bank, don't you think it's time we go back to really pushing Glass-Steagall, the breaking apart of the banks. We, we can't just say if all the money is given somewhere else, we're going to get everything right. The money is being poured in now. Where does it go? It goes to stock buybacks. We need to, to break apart and stop the financialization of the economy, break apart the, the banks with Glass-Steagall, and get the motor for an economic development. So I know you support Glass-Steagall. Yes. You know, and I, I know that you've been part of the bill of it. Yep. Maybe you could explain that to people because a lot of people don't know what that is. Thank you. Thanks for raising this issue. This is a good one to close our conversation on with because it is one that impacts us all. Uh, we had a town hall, losing track of my days here. Was it yesterday? It was the day before yesterday in uh, Virginia Beach. And there was a couple who came who talked about how they lost their home because of the 2008 crisis and how even as they've seen uh, big bailouts of Wall Street banks, uh, taxpayer funded, that there has been no relief for families like theirs who lost everything, so many people. And also pointing out that no one has been, uh, no one's been sent to prison or taken any kind of responsibility legally for the damage and the chaos and the havoc that they wreaked by gambling with our money by gambling with our future. And the way that they were able to do this was largely because of the repeal of Glass-Steagall that basically said the Glass-Steagall Act created this wall, this separation between commercial banking 
and uh, the kinds of, of very risky gambling investment practices that a lot of the banks have been using that drove us to that crash in 2008. I've talked to some folks who worked on Wall Street during that time who are now, uh, what do they call it, recovering Wall Street people, but who are speaking the truth. They saw it right up close and personal and are some of the biggest advocates now for reinstating the Glass-Steagall Act because they see how much of an impact it would have. That even as Dodd-Frank, the Dodd-Frank bill was passed that was supposed to fix what was broken that caused this huge crash in 2008, it hasn't. It hasn't. The big banks are bigger today than they were in 2008. And the ones who have experienced the negative impact uh, from Dodd-Frank have been the small banks, the community banks, the medium-sized banks, those who are doing the right thing and being responsible with the dollars that we entrust them to hold in this financial system are now dealing with the negative impact. So yes, it is about the reinstatement of the Glass-Steagall Act. It's long overdue and necessary for us to begin to chip away at the problem that has brought us to this position today. Once again, where those who are working in this financial sector are extremely concerned about the impending crash, that it's not about if, it's about when, and how our leaders in our government will react to it. Which is part of the problem with this whole bailout that happened before, is the bad banks, the bad actors were not allowed to fail. They were rescued by us. So, so then we need to see how, learn from those mistakes of 2008 and understand with very clear eyes about what we will have to go through as a country to try to right the ship and get us back on a solid economic path. And that requires courageous leadership because it's easier to just throw money at a problem and think that it's gonna solve it, but it's not. It's actually exacerbated this problem and it's been the American people who have lost as a result. It's going back to your question, sir, about having the strong leadership to choose to do the right thing, no matter the hardship or the political cost, and knowing that ultimately, whether it's in the short term or the long term, it will be to the benefit of the people of our country. Something that I uh, heard from one of my drill sergeants when I first joined the military, way back when, 17 years ago, they said, choose the hard right over the easy wrong. That those tough decisions are almost always the hardest ones to make. It's easy to put your head in the sand. It's easy to just smile and say what people want to hear, but then turn your back and do the opposite. This is why the choice that voters across this country have right now in this election is so critical. To choose that courageous leadership and not make your judgment based on who on the debate stage had like the hardest slam or snipe or puts out the craziest tweets. We know what's at stake. It's our country, it's our military, men and women, their families, our veterans, our children, our environment. There is so much at stake. And we've got to make that choice to send a message to leaders in Washington that we are done with a government of, by, and for the powerful elite, and we are exercising our voices to ensure we bring about a government of, by, and for the people. And this is very directly how each of you can help. The obstacles are great. The challenges seem very difficult, and they are. But it is our voices who have always and who will continue to be the most powerful effect in this country if we choose to use it, if we choose to use our voices. If all we do is kind of turn our backs because the world is too crazy and too ugly and too hard to deal with and just focus inward and not be a part of that change and lead that change, then we will end up on the path, we will end up continuing down the path that we are on. We can't afford to do so, and here's why. Because as Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself cannot stand, he closed that speech by saying, we shall not fail. If we stand fast, we shall not fail. That is a challenge to every single one of us to ensure 
that we will not fail. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for making the time to be here today. It's wonderful to see you. And thanks for continuing to help spread, spread our message. Thank you.